Okay, so the other thing is, so we do have that steak dinner contest coming up. Many of you are leaving for Aruba, uh, which is super exciting. Um, that most of you are leaving, uh, well, a lot of the CSPs are leaving on Thursday, so you guys will have a ton of fun. Make sure you relax and have a good time. Um, I know rep trips are fun, whether it's your first one or 10th one or fifth one, whatever it may be. Um, the uh, rep trips are a blast, so make sure you have a lot of fun and meet a lot of people. But um, we do have the steak dinner contest. Um, this starts uh, basically the last couple of days of Aruba. So for those of you that are not going on the trip, you'll have a couple extra days to get a head start. Um, just to remind you, the only uh, sales that count towards this are event sales. So that's anything coming from a traditional event, an industry event, a mall display, um, a service and sales event, um, anything like that. Uh, but the contest dates are the 25th through May 15th. So uh, make sure if you don't have any events scheduled, you get some service events or something scheduled during those dates. <clears throat> I think right now the two divisions, uh, so we do have two divisions that will host these dinners. Um, so whichever divisions uh, sell the most, I, that's where the dinner is going to be located. So right now, the two divisions that have the most events scheduled are Big Sky and Chicago. So uh, if you're not if you're not wanting to go to those divisions to eat steak, I would recommend getting some service calls or sorry, service events or service call leads from an event. Obviously those work too. Um, but uh, yeah, any event sales will come towards that. These are the locations, um, the actual steak dinner, the date will be uh, determined at a later time um, after the contest, but uh, hopefully end of May or June is the goal. So um, these are the locations that were, uh, these are the seven potential locations, depending on which two divisions. And then just a reminder, the, the sales is not based on where the rep is. It's where the events happen. So if you're a Chicago rep working in Northwoods, your sales for that week will count towards the Northwoods division, um, for, uh, for the year event sales. So, um, but yeah, so pretty awesome steak dinners here. Um, you just got to sell 5,000 to qualify and then it's just 50 bucks to attend. If you sell 10,000, you get to go for free. And if you sell $20,000 in event sales, you can bring a significant other to one of them, or you can go to both dinners, either or. Does anyone have any questions about the steak dinner contest coming up? If I don't have a significant other, can I bring a friend? <laughs> um, We're going to keep it to significant others only, but um, you're more than uh, welcome to go to both dinners. Hopefully cool. they'll any other questions okay awesome um another thing too uh for those of you that have been invited to wisconsin state fair i should have the schedule set um It'll be end of uh, this week or by the, by the time you get back from Aruba. So um, I'll send out some communication there. Um, we do have a couple of guests coming in. Uh, super excited for our team this year. Goals to do a half a million at Wisconsin. And I think we can definitely do it with the squad that we have. So um, super excited for uh, for our state fair team. Uh, for those of you that typically work Missouri State Fair, or have worked Missouri State Fair, that schedule has not been set. Uh, but again, hopefully that one will be done by end of Aruba as well. Um, and then um, the only other things too, uh, so uh, we do have a couple openings on the team for event managers. So we do have, let me pull that up too for you guys. Um, so we do have, <clears throat> somebody that we're actually promoting here sorry my voice is a little off uh midwest horse fair talks a lot so not not in state fair shape it was great um but yeah so this is our uh, team structure for our team josh i don't know if you're feeling a little rough either but uh, my throat is like stop talking nick um <clears throat> anyway so uh obviously this is our team structure for our leadership team uh lucky is the recruiting manager uh my wife christina does the booking and schedule manager she does like our booking requests split tabs all that stuff uh caden our research and development manager um and then our pr promotion promoter relations manager seth Gurecki. he's actually now taking on another role which is our display kit manager um so we uh we talked about it a couple of weeks ago and we have him starting to work on some stuff so if you do use community kits um seth is going to be 
uh, the one in charge of them uh, basically moving forward. We're still building some systems to help uh, it make it easier to track display kits um, and uh, how to, you know, where to pick up and drop off and all that. So uh, in the next couple of weeks and months, uh, just be on the lookout for uh, more communication from Seth on that. And then also, um, you know, from me as well, as uh, Seth and I uh, start to build that system. Um, and then the other thing too, just so you guys know, we do have a couple openings. We do have some AM positions available. So if you want to learn from any of the event managers, um, just doing very small tasks and learning what they do, um, <clears throat> those are obviously all open. And then we also have a mall display manager position that we just opened up. Um, this uh, person would be in charge of our holiday displays um, and also the short-term leases that we're looking to get into um, as well throughout the year. So if you don't have any events during the steak dinner contest, and you want to do a short-term lease at your local mall. That is an opportunity. Obviously, we're kind of late in the game for starting to plan that. But if you want to do it, you know, over Mother's Day weekend, I know Pat Moore is doing that um, at the uh, at the uh, West. I think it's called West Town or something like that. West County uh, Mall. It's in St. Louis, but uh, he's going to be doing that at, at his mall. But if you want to do the same thing, do a short term lease. I think the company average is twenty five hundred to seventy five hundred CPO um, in a weekend. So you know, that'd be a good way to add some sales during the steak dinner contest as well. So, um, but anyway, so if, if you do feel called to step up and uh, take on a uh, event manager position, that is a position that is open. And then obviously all the uh, assistant manager um, positions are open as well. So, um, so yeah, so be on the lookout for that. If you guys are interested in applying for anything, there is an apply now button on the website. Uh, so just check that out and uh, we can definitely, um, set up an interview if you feel called to step up and be a leader in an event manager role position. Um, any other questions about anything? What's the perks of being one of those managers, AMs versus managers and all that? Um, so an AM, uh, an AM is really a learning role. So um, there aren't any actual perks for uh, being an assistant manager, but you know the goal would obviously be to be promoted to an event manager position eventually. That's actually what Seth Jarecki did originally. He actually uh, was an assistant manager under Caden, learned a ton from Caden, and then he uh, we decided to promote him to an event manager position, and uh, he's doing great at it. So um, so that's that's what an assistant manager role would look like, and then for um, an actual event manager role, you get three uh, three picks um, each campaign before the rest of the team. Um, that's all organized uh, by sales among the other event managers. Um, but you get three picks. They can't double up with me or another event manager, but you can pick anything in the calendar, no matter what tier you're in. And then um, you also get um, six, uh, six shifts at Wisconsin State Fair automatically um, if you choose to be there. And then... Um, and then you get to be on all the phone calls with us, uh, the rest of the event managers. We have weekly phone calls um, just to talk about uh, growth of the team and building systems and what we're working on. So you get to be a part of those. And then, um, yeah, that's uh, and then you also get to, you know, obviously learn how to be an event manager and be a leader on the team and learn how to manage people. So obviously, those are all great perks, too. So, so yeah, so that's kind of what an event manager gets. And then, um, yeah. It's a great, great opportunity to learn how to manage and uh, be a part of a, a program and do some of the stuff in the background that's always not fun to do, but um, it's for the better of the team. So does that kind of help, Nick? Cool. Hopefully it did. Um, any other questions? question for you on the chat, Nick, from from Nick, actually. What's the question? It says no percent of CPO. Yeah, so like AM pay, like if you're a system manager for an office or whatnot, they give AM pay and all that. Does that work for any of these or what? Uh, no, uh, it does not. No. So you get paid by uh, picking events, getting three extra picks before the rest of the team. Any other questions? Anything? 
I've got one. Yeah, Rob, what do you got? You said you get, did you say um, your man, do you get six shift picks at the Wisconsin Fair? Uh, you get six uh, shifts at the Wisconsin State Fair, yeah, if you choose to go. And then um, you also get um, the three additional picks um, per campaign. So that's the that's the payment for being an event manager, yeah. So you get to pick then in tier one if you're tier two? Yep. Yeah, you can pick in tier one if you choose to, even if you're tier two. Um, and what, what are the shifts at Wisconsin? Half-day shifts? Um, no, we do full day shifts at Wisconsin. How um, long is that for? for this year? If you were to step up and apply, it wouldn't be for this year, but obviously it would be, you know, if you're an event manager and you continue to stick on, you'd, it would be for next year's Wisconsin State Fair. That fair's pretty long, huh? 11 days. 11 days. Those are All like right. Where, where does it say what your duties are or everything? And you got that posted up somewhere? Um, well, it's uh, the mall display manager is the one is the open position we have right now. So you'd basically be in charge of, uh, you know, contacting uh, malls and negotiating leases and then also uh, building relationships uh, with the mall managers to, um, you know, have uh, short term leases and stuff like that. And then, you know, encourage people on the team to sign up for those those uh, short term leases. So that's that's uh, the gist of the position. We don't have a system set in place. I honestly have no idea what it would look like at this point, but we'd build it. So. So, yeah, Jared, go ahead. So you had mentioned that um, for some of the malls, you're getting like a, I don't know if it's for some of the malls or just the Appleton mall, a better display, like a permanent type thing. Is there a, like an ETA on that or how many there are and which malls use them, stuff like that. I'm just curious. Yeah, so um, so for those of you that don't know, Appleton is requiring us to get new tables. Um, otherwise, we have to use a kiosk. Um, so we're getting some wooden tables uh, made. We should have them done by mid-July. Um, so, and then we're gonna use them at Wisconsin State Fair um, and see how they work. And then we'll be using them in the Appleton uh, Mall as well. So um, that's what we're, planning on right now. Um, so yeah, so basically, if you're asking if you'd be able to use them um, in the fall for like a short term lease, you know, campaign through would be the earliest that you'd be able to use those. Otherwise, you could always get a kiosk um, if you're looking to do a short term lease in May or June, Jared, um, in the Appleton Mall. So and I think we could definitely get a short term lease at Appleton. I think they'd be open to that for sure. Does that help, Jared? Jared, you there? Yes, sorry, I was on mute. All good. Um, so yeah, so everything's good that answered it, perfect. Um, any other questions about malls or anything else? Okay, awesome. Well, um, if you have no other questions here, we're going to take uh, five minutes here and wait for Jess to hop on here. And then uh, we'll reconvene. Um, obviously, feel free to stick on and share some hot news here. Um, and then uh, after Jess speaks, we'll do the drawing and then we'll be we'll be good to go. So um, but yeah, if you have any other questions, uh, I'll be here. Otherwise, if you need to run to the bathroom, grab some water, anything like that, go for it. Now's the time to do so.
Hey, Nick. Have you already collected um, ROR lists for campaign two? Um, I haven't done that yet. Um, I'll probably send something out here because the campaign ends, um, well, obviously next week. So we'll probably, we're going to require those like May 1st. So I'll probably post something in the next, well, probably this week here. But yeah, if you want to send your ROR now, you're more than welcome to do so. So cool. go for it. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah. Yeah, if you do want to send that, you are more than welcome to now. And then um, I'll be asking for it, um, you know, probably end of the week or early next week. Sweet. Anyone else got some hot news from last week or last month or anything or no? And I got to witness uh, your best day ever. So that was pretty cool. Appreciate it, Josh. It was great working, working with you and grabbing some beers after too and barbecue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it and it, it was kind of cool um, watching Nick do what he did because, one, you're just really good at closing. So you just closed everybody that you were talking to. I even watched you close, like, a 16-year-old uh, for, like, a K-bar, and I was like, what the – how did that even just happen? Um, but just having that mentality of nobody walks um, was huge, and then – you know, the thing that you were saying, you were like, I don't feel like I'm the best at all these things, but I just do them really well, like proficiently. And then you were promoting the bigger packages. Like one thing I noticed that you did was you just showed the kitchen to literally every, every single person. Um, and then, you know, you, you sold the kitchen that weekend. So it was kind of cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's uh, and that's a big thing too. If you guys aren't doing that now, um, I know Josh and I talked about that this past weekend. It was like, um, you know, show the kitchen to literally everybody because you never know um, who's going to, you know, like be okay spending, you know, eight grand. Like I, I sold the kitchen. It was like a Siggy accomplished cookware set in the flatware, and it was like she dropped it like it was nothing, like eight thousand dollars. Like oh. Yeah, sure. Throw the flatware on. It's only an extra two grand. Like what? She was spending like it was two hundred dollars instead of two grand, right? So you never know. And it's like um, something that I do is whenever you get, um, whenever you show the kitchen. I told Josh this too, but it's like whenever you show the kitchen, ninety eight percent of the people that look at it, they're gonna laugh, right? It's like, oh yeah, so this is our full complete Cutco kitchen package. You get the knife set, the flour, the pots and pans, all the accessories. Um, this is the retail price, and it's only eleven thousand dollars today. And you can split it up on our easy pay. So it's like an extra mortgage payment for five months. You never have to worry about anything for the kitchen ever again. And then the, and the people are like, are you kidding? That's nuts. It's like, yeah, you know, most people don't start there, but you know, it is an option. And then you just move to the knife sets. But the reason why you do that is your price position. So now the ultimate looks like super cheap compared to the $11,000 package you showed them. Then for that, you know, two to 5% of people that you, that you show that to, there's going to be that one person where they just like look at it and they're just going to be like, and then, you know, it's like, oh, shit, they can afford this, right? If they don't laugh and they're now thinking about it, it's like, okay, this is a game on. This is a Cutco Kitchen client. And it's like, so I showed her, I showed her the kitchen because she was actually looking at cookware originally, the kitchen that I sold this weekend. You know, explain the cookware. 
And then I showed her, showed her the kitchen package. And, the, and then the first question I asked after I, you know, extra mortgage payment, blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay, what's the, uh, I was, I was like, so are you, are you mainly looking for just pots and pans today? Could you use knives? Could you use flatware? Could you use accessories or like, could you use all this stuff? And she's like, oh, well, maybe we could use knives too. I was like, okay. Elevator pitch on knives. Her mom already owned a set of knives. So she kind of already knew the quality and everything. Cut a penny, right? So I literally cut a penny. She's, I was like, have you seen these cut a penny before? And she's like, no. She's like, no, 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 you don't have to do it. And I'm like, no, no, it's cool. I'll pay for the cheap entertainment. You know, cut a penny. She's like, oh my gosh, this is insane. And she's like, yeah, we'll do the, we'll do the white handles. I didn't even ask for the order, right? She's just like, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do the knife set in white. And then the cookware, do they only come in the black handles? And I was like, yeah, they only come in the dark handles, but. I'm like, okay, I guess I'm writing this up, right? And then, you know, after I get that, then I then you know go back and upsell. It's like, hey, you know, obviously you're already getting the the knives and the and the uh, cookware. Like, would you be open to adding on the flour and, and the accessories too? Because I mean, it's not much more to add those two packages. You got the two most expensive ones out of the way. And she's like, oh well, tell me about the flatware. Explain the flatware real quick. And she goes, ah, throw that on too. And the only thing I said about the flatware is, you know, it's dishwasher safe, you know, if the garbage pulls will accident, send it back. If you're, you know, if you lose four, I'll replace four of them for free for you. That's something that I do, not Cutco does. And then I, um, I was, uh, all I did is I, yeah, I literally just said, so this is the discount for the cookware in the, in the knife set. If you had the flatware, like it's the most discounted set we sell. So you're getting like an extra $800 off just by adding, you know, off your flatware. So if you want to add it on, you know, we got that really good corporate discount going on right now too. She's like, ah, sure, throw it on. And it's like Cutco Kitchen, right? And then I tried to upsell accessories, but then she was starting to hit her limit. It's like, okay, she didn't want to spend 10 grand but, or 11 grand, she was okay spending eight grand. And then I was like, okay, I got to, like, she literally was, that was, everything was full price. I didn't throw a single thing, thing in for free and she was all good. But I was like, hey, I understand you're spending a lot of money. Like out of these accessories, which one would you, would you, would you use the most? And she's like, oh, the spatulas we'd probably use. I was like, okay, well, this package is like $200 for these three spatulas for a bacon serve set. I'm just going to buy those for you. Okay. Cause you're going to love them. You're investing in me and my business and Cutco. You're going to love the stuff. Your family already does. You already get it. It's awesome. So, but that whole conversation doesn't, doesn't even happen unless you show that, you know, Cutco kitchen uh, sheet for sell sheet. Yeah. So did they see the price of the kitchen first before they closed on like the cookware? Yeah. So I, I don't even think I made it to the cookware section. I just started with the Cutco kitchen and then I, I went to bundles right away. And it's like, well, if the kitchen is too much, we do have a cookware and knife bundle. You want to see what that is? Yeah, sure. Show them that. Because at, at that point of the interaction, I already knew, knew she didn't want the legacy pieces. She only wanted the accomplished pieces. So I knew that. And then I, um, she didn't want an ultimate set. She only wanted the Siggy. So I was like, okay, well, we have the family bundle for knives and cookware, you know, it's like 6,500 bucks or whatever it is. And then, yeah. And then I didn't even ask the order. She's just like, okay, here. Yeah. We'll take white handles. What? I didn't even ask you. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> um, but yeah. But anyway, so I uh, wanted to bring up our guest speaker here, uh, Jess. Um, Jess, I got to meet at the uh, retreat here, or sorry, not retreat, coordinator summit, whatever they call it. Um, it was great. Uh, we got to go to Cleveland and uh, go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with all the other coordinators. Good time. Um, you know, got to meet with all the other coordinators, but obviously Jess was there too. So um, Jess is from the um he's from the ohio area actually right is that right yes yeah yeah grew up in cleveland awesome. live in columbus yep. got it okay cool so yeah so jess um is from that area so obviously you have to fly and it was great weather weather on the way home was a little rough but uh jess is at 1.65 million dollars in career sales um his best week is thirty-two thousand uh, dollars his best day is fourteen thousand dollars um, I actually just had my best day on Saturday, but it wasn't 14 grand. So uh, kudos to you, $14,000. That's the uh, next next level right there. 
uh, multiple push weeks over sixty thousand um, dollars, which is awesome. He's got a bachelor's uh, degree from uh, West Virginia University. Uh, no, no kids, but an awesome dog. Um, and you have a cat too, huh? Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out if I like it or not. Yeah, I have one of those too. It came with my wife, but it, <laughs> uh, yeah, cats are, yeah, they're a little weird. So yeah. those old cats, they're they're a little crazy. But um, she's like ten, and it's like you walk past her and she wants to like kill you, and then the next minute she's like, oh yeah, pet me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then uh, Jess is also a, a big Cleveland Browns fan um, and he loves live music and then uh, is a terrible golfer, but you have a great attitude on the course. Love that. <laughs> but yeah, I just want to bring Jess up. Jess is here to uh, speak about how to have um, 10K or how to make every event a 10K event. So Jess, go ahead and take it away. Right on, guys. Well, I, I appreciate the introduction, Nick. It was cool getting a chance to meet you. We didn't get to spend much time together, so hopefully we get to hang out. I don't know if you're going to Aruba or not this week, but if you are. I won't won't be there this year uh, just because we just had a baby. Um, she's oh, only congrats. so off off this year, but I'll definitely see you in Madrid. Cool. Well, well, we'll have some Spanish wine together next year. Yeah, there we go. Right on, guys. Uh, cool, yeah, so I'll just go ahead and dive in. Yeah, so the title of my message is Every Show is a 10K Show. And the way I kind of came up with this was we had a CSP meeting last year within our region. Uh, region manager asked me to speak, and the idea was, you know, how do you make a smaller event a great event? So that's really the inspiration behind what I'm sharing with you all today. And I think a lot of people, when they talk about building events, the idea immediately goes to, well, work it for a few years and then build it through marketing, which absolutely make sure you're doing that. Um, I'm not the master marketer, though. There's hundreds of other people who are probably better at it than I am. Um, so this is not a marketing message. What I really focused on was, you know, when it comes to developing events is it really comes down to developing yourself. And what I looked at, what's helped me have is, and I do have about a 10K average per event um, so far for the last two years or so. Um, what I noticed that what I've gotten better at over the years really broke down into three main areas. Um, it broke down into my mentality, my discipline, and my skill set. Now, when it comes to growing skill set, there's so many other better people to talk to than me. Um, there's upserving videos from Josh Muller. There's pet. There's videos from Matt Graves talking about package deals. There's videos from Seth Kinzer and Burt Works selling ultimates. Um, Luciano talking about Cutco kitchens. Um, I want to point out that everything that I do in the booth is something that has been taught to me. I am not one of those people who has kind of created any programs for the company the way some of the best people have. So I am going to share some skill, stu skill set stuff. There are a couple things that I, I think I've done well that I think it helps people sell more and have a higher average order. Um, I do have about an $800 average order in the booth, so I'll help there a little bit. But most of this message is focused on your mentality and your discipline. So to start off, I'm going to begin with mentality. And I want you all to understand, I'm not just going to sit here and tell you guys to think big. Um, I am going to tell you that, but I'm not just going to say, just start thinking big and it magically happens. What I'm going to teach you is some ways of thinking and some tools to be intentional with how you think. So I want to ask you all this before we really dive into the content. What are the thoughts you're having before an event? What do you think about? Do you make assumptions of how the event's going to go? Do you draw conclusions about the event based on its demographic? Do you make assumptions based off the type of event it is? Its previous results? Do you really focus on, well, it sold 5K this year, so hopefully I can get it to 6K um, the next year, right? Have you decided how an event can go before it even starts? My first suggestion is to humble yourself and understand that you have no idea. You don't know. You don't know who's going to show up to the event that day. You don't know who's going to be there. 
You don't know what kind of mood people are going to be in, and you just don't know what can happen. So I think the best way to approach an event is not really worry too much about what's happened in the past or what your experience is. Um, it's just to approach it with openness, curiosity, and with the intention to do your best. So show up to the event open, curious, and have the intention to do your absolute best with every single interaction. Now, I started off by saying the title of this message, message is every show is a 10K show, but don't let me limit you, right? The question I want to ask you guys is how do you feel about selling massively? What are your emotions and thoughts around selling big? And for some people, that is your, your first 10K event, but I know there's people on this call who have had plenty of 10K events. So maybe it's 20, maybe it's 40, maybe it's your first personal 100K event. Um, I think a lot of us, most people are still chasing that, right? But we can get there. So again, how do you feel about selling massively? I suggest that when you think about selling massively, you should think two things. You should think about how easy it is and how quickly it can happen. You know, it's perfect that I come into this call with Nick talking about selling a Cutco kitchen and it sounded pretty easy. He just did his job. He showed a kitchen. He handled some objections that they didn't want everything. He dropped down to cookware and knife set, and then he upserves flatware, right? It didn't sound very challenging. And it sounded, I'm going to guess, Nick, that probably wasn't an hour long demo, right? It probably took you 15, 20 minutes to sell that order, right? Yeah. Yeah. So again, when it comes to selling massively, you should be thinking about how easy it is and how quickly it can happen. Make sure you write this down. CPO is not generated based on time. CPO is not generated based on time. A lot of the time, and just like you know, I just talked about with Nick, our largest in the orders in the booth, they happen the quickest. Our biggest orders happen the fastest. It's the it's the trimmer that you fight for that takes 30 minutes, right? But that ultimate set can happen in a pitch, a close, a credit card, a goodbye next customer, right? So again, don't focus on what time of the day it is, right? Don't be a clock watcher. This is another big one that so many of us, so many mistakes that we all make. I've done it myself. I know everybody who's ever worked in a booth has made this mistake where you're watching the clock and you've set this benchmark for yourself of how much Cutco you need to sell that day. And maybe it's seven hours into your 10 hour shift. And you're thinking, you know, I wanted to sell 4K today and I'm only at 800 bucks. There's not enough time for me to sell another $3,200. Uh, get that out of your thought process. Because what happens is then you start to feel negative. You doubt yourself and you stop trying as hard. And then you don't give that customer who could be walking up ready to buy a Cutco kitchen, but because you decided it's too late in the day to, for that to happen, they don't get the opportunity to buy it because you made a decision. You decided not to be open and you decided not to be curious and to not do your best. Yeah, is that, um, that best day that Nick referenced, my $14,000 day, I was till a nine o'clock uh, end time. And at 4.30, I was at 2K. The shift started at 10. So in the first six and a half hours, I sold 2,000. And in the last four, I sold 12. It was an ultimate set with cookware uh, and then a flatware set and then an upgrade, right? So you guys understand that CPO and the time of day have nothing to do with each other. You can sell a homemaker within the first two minutes of your show and then take a break for a long time and then have uh, back, back orders, right? So don't be a clock watcher. Again, massive CPO can be created at any moment. And that's just something that I constantly think to myself, especially when it's a day that maybe isn't starting off very strong. On the days that start off slow, and maybe you're working with somebody and maybe they don't have the best attitude, remind them and remind yourself, hey, 
All it takes is one massive CPO can be created at any moment. Uh, my next suggestion for the way you think at your events, don't be overly emotionally connected to a number of orders goal for the day or an average order. So it's great to make goals, right? Like that's why we're in this business. We set high goals, right? But don't let yourself get too connected to a number of orders goal for the day or an average order. The reason why I believe this is you don't want the one interaction to affect how you approach the next. Averages work themselves out over large sets of data. So you can't look at your one day average order as it meaning anything. You can look at a campaign number of orders and CPO as an average that works out. But one day or one show doesn't work out, right? It's not a big enough set of data. And I also believe this, focusing on an average order is how you get average results. Focusing on an average order is how you get average results. You just need to be thinking about doing your absolute best in every interaction and creating as much CPO as possible. That's all we have to do is just when you're talking to a customer, create as much CPO as possible with them. And sometimes that's the Cutco Kitchen. Sometimes it's a package deal. Sometimes it's a buy three, get one. And that's okay, right? But you just have to create as much CPO with that customer that they're comfortable with and that you can help them see the value in. So you guys, it's always great to celebrate a great average order. It's great to celebrate hitting your number of orders goal for the day. I just suggest you do this at the end of the day or at the end of the show. Um, that's why my next tip is don't count CPO until the day is over. It's irrelevant. Don't ask your coworkers where they're at because it doesn't serve you. It just serves your ego. Now, if somebody asks you where you're, where they're at, you can, I normally just give people ballpark numbers because I'm not going to be, Hey man, I'm not telling you what I'm at for the day. Uh, but I just try to give a ballpark and I just said, yeah, you know, I'm probably around this much for the day, but I'm just excited for my next interaction. Because if I'm working in the booth, my goal is just always to continue selling more product. Uh, and the last thing I'll share when it comes to mentality about your results from an event. Redefine for yourself what it means to have a good day and a great day. Here's what I believe. There's no such thing as a bad day in the booth. We have a silly job. We make way too much money for selling kitchen stuff. So like, I just don't have bad days in the booth. Sometimes I don't have a great day selling wise, but that's just sales, right? It's going to happen. So for me, I just have the mindset of like, there's no such thing as a bad day. Every day is a good day, but I don't have many great days either. And let me explain why. And what I mean when I say redefine what a good day and a great day is, is I'm asking you to increase your expectations and your standards for yourself. So what I mean when I say I don't have many great days in the booth is the way I look at it is a great day in the booth is when I beat my personal record, which right now it's 14,000. That was February of 2022. So I haven't had a great day in the booth um, in over a year. I've had plenty of good days. I've had plenty of 10K days. But my goal for a great day is to exceed what my best day is. So I'm always grateful for my results. I don't want this to sound like, you know, I'm not grateful and it's never good enough. It's always good enough. I'm always having a good day. But I'm also very excited for what's possible and having a great day. So what I think that does for you is when you have that attitude of it's always a good day and you're, you're looking for a great day is you get to approach every single event with excitement because you know, regardless of results, you're in a good spot. And if you have the right mentality and are disciplined to do the right things, it can be great. So let's talk about discipline. What does it mean to be disciplined in the booth? This isn't like an official Webster's dictionary definition of discipline. But when I think of discipline in the booth, this is what I think of. I believe it's not making assumptions of or decisions for your customers. So don't make assumptions of your customers and don't make decisions for them. 
So we've all heard the saying, you know, every package, every customer, every time. Something that I believe is every demo, every customer at the right time. And Nick did this when he talks about his Cutco kitchen. What did he do? He cut a penny. The woman told him she didn't need to see it. She was sold on Cutco. But I have a good feeling that that moved her 20% closer to getting everything. She might have still got the knife set if Nick didn't cut that penny, but stack the deck. Give yourself the best chance to sell and get her emotionally involved, right? So every demo, every customer at the right time. Um, this is especially important for people, for those customers you perceive as people who get it. It's the most important for customers who walk up and say, oh, I know Cutco, you don't need to sell me, honey. Those are the people you have to sell the hardest. And here's why. Um, you just need to double down. Just because someone's in step with you as the logical reasons to buy Cutco doesn't mean they were going to buy. If people bought Cutco on logic alone, we wouldn't have a job. I'll repeat that. If people bought Cutco on logic alone, we wouldn't have a job. They would just go to the website and not think, think twice and buy Cutco kitchens. But people justify reasons with logic, but they buy because of emotion. So we need to build emotional value. And how do we do that? We, of course, fully explain the concepts behind what we're selling. We tell needle moving stories and we build emotional value. Again, that's cutting leather with past customers. That's cutting pennies with past customers. Of course, doing that with new customers, but cutting leather and pennies with them. Cut co-owners are cocky. They think they know everything. I love cut co-owners. I don't mean to say anything bad about them, right? You know, most of our orders come from cut co-owners, but when you do your job with discipline and you fully do a demo and you fully explain things for them, even though they've told you that they think they know everything, that's how you get them to buy upgrades and package deals instead of two to four pieces. And yes, this is something that I do from time to time. It's a bit divisive across the events community. Um, I still cut food sometimes. And I know a lot of people will say you don't need to cut food. And they're right. You don't need to cut food. But I'd rather have the opportunity to do it and not need it than to need it and not have it. So it's just another tool and it's just a strategy. And again, this is mainly for past customers. So here's my belief. Cutco is better at cutting than we are at talking. Cutco is better at cutting than we are at talking. So just how I feel is, you know, if I need something to get my point across better, cutting a potato comes in handy. And you don't have to have five, six different kinds of food. Just having a couple potatoes on hand. One potato can last you four or five customers, right? But here's what it can do for you. It can stall people and slow them down and allow them to take pressure off their themselves and reset their thinking pattern. We've all seen that customers start to get like, you don't really know why, not, you haven't even like asked them for the order yet, but they're starting to get like a little tense. Like you've shown them the price, you haven't asked them to buy it yet, but they know the price, they know the ask is coming. So they start to get like a little like, they haven't said they're gonna walk away yet, but you can tell it's about to come. This is the perfect time to cut food because what does that do? It gets them excited again. It slows them down. It resets things. Their heart rate starts to go down. And if you don't have a potato, that's a good time to cut a penny. That's a good time to cut leather again with a different knife than you cut with the first time. Because that just reinforces the value of, yeah, all of these knives cut the same. They're used for different jobs, but they're all the same quality. 
Yeah, guys, again, cutting food can also help people who are bad listeners because it can break up the cadence of your speaking patterns. So we all talk at a little bit different of a pace, a different tone, a different voice inflection. And sometimes we work these events that have, you know, it's inside a big expo building. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, we're bad listeners, right? Like us in the Cutco community, we're pretty good at it. We're salespeople, right? But like the general public has short attention spans and they're not great listeners. So what do we have to do? We have to help them pay attention. And again, cutting food or cutting leather or cutting a penny at the right time can bring their attention back to what you want them to focus on. It can help with efficiency and save time. You guys, the purpose of cutting in the booth is not to show them how well Cutco works. It's to elicit an emotional reaction. They know it's going to cut well. Every product at a show is probably in some way or another a pretty good product for the most part. Don't get me wrong. There's some junky stuff. There's some other knife companies um, that work at our events that we work, right? Um, but those aren't terrible knives, right? Like those things are going to cut well too, especially because they're new, right? So we're not cutting stuff to show them how good Cutco is at cutting. We're cutting stuff to have them feel an emotion. So you can tell them how much they're going to love it, how great it feels to cut with a quality knife and how nice it is. And you can just talk all about how good it is or they can feel how good it is. Let them feel things is the idea behind cutting. So again, I understand all the arguments as to why you don't need to cut food to sell Cutco. And I agree with them. They are true. Again, I just think I'd rather have a potato and not need it than to need it and not have it. It's as simple as that. Uh, my next discipline tip for you guys is to show videos of knives cutting every time. How often are you providing proof for customers? How disciplined are you when it comes to doing that? So I think some people maybe won't do that every time because they think it's going to take more time. They feel like that customer's in a rush. But all it does is save you time on the back end because you're going to do less objection handling and less negotiation. So just show videos of knives cutting food. Show the raw meat knife cutting chicken breast. Show the melon knife cutting a melon. Show the veggie knife or the hearty slicer cutting a squash, right? Whatever else is out there. Um, I found two to three videos tends to be enough. If you're going to show eight to nine knives, two to three videos is good. But you just want to provide proof for people. Again, Cutco's better at cutting than we are at talking. So let the video doing the cutting do the talking for you. Uh, my next tip for you guys is to make sure you have the discipline to be strategic in your, in your interactions and to remember to move the needle. So for example, rapport is a strategy to make a sale, not to make a friend. Once you have their credit card and you think they're super cool and you want to be their friend, that's when you can go into rapport mode and make, and you know, blah, blah, blah. But rapport is a strategy to sell more product, not to get them to like you. And people make the mistake of thinking that people have to like you to buy a lot from you. But what I found is the people who buy a lot from you end up liking you the most. So a strategic tip I have for you is if you notice that the customer is smiling or laughing or is very engaged in a part of your conversation that's not focused on Cutco, because it just naturally happens sometimes, and maybe they just told you a story and they really love sharing that story and it lights them up to share that with people, and now they feel really good, a lot of reps make the mistake of staying like in that zone because the customer now feels really good, but that's the perfect time to go back to selling Cutco because now they feel great. And now they're going to receive the information you're giving them more openly because how good they feel. In regards to moving the needle, 
this is the next tip I have for you guys is don't let teaching, storytelling, or joke telling get in the way of selling and closing. So don't let teaching, storytelling, or joke telling get in the way of selling or closing. All three of those things are very important. I'm not saying not to do those things, but be strategic, meaning teach something, then transition into building value. So what's an example of teaching something? They tell you how they don't love their chef's knife, right? Yeah, it just dulls out quicker than I thought it would. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, can I ask you, what do you tend to use it on? Right, and this is a very simple example, right? What do you tend to use it on? And then you find out that they're either using glass cutting boards or they're probably using it to like carve meat a bunch and they're trying to cut through bone with it, which it can do it, but it's really not designed for it, right? So if they're using glass cutting boards, that's an easy way to transition into why our cutting boards are great. And oh, by the way, they come in this upgrade package with new customer requested knives that actually has a knife designed for maybe cutting through bone because you might be using it on that too. So teach, then transition into building value. When you tell stories, do you know why you tell that story? What is the goal of that story? Some people just tell stories because they were told that stories sell. And they do, but do you know why you're why that story sells? So tell the story and understand whether the point of that story is to evoke an emotional response or a logical one, and then build off of that. If you like to tell a lot of jokes, right? Tell the joke and use that emotional reaction to break tension and then gain attention for the next value statement you're going to make. Next tip I have for you guys is be disciplined and bold enough to not let one half of a couple tune you out. This will save you so much time and sell you a lot of cutco. If you have the if you have the boldness to not let the husband ignore you, to not let the wife turn around when the husband's interested in the set. If they walk away, Hey, 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 Tammy, what's your husband's name? Hey, Bill, come back here for a second. I got to make sure you know this. If their back is turned to you, put something in their hand. Put a brochure in their hand. Put the guarantee sheet in the hand. Put a knife in their hand. And if they refuse to pay attention to you, and they're just really like, hey, this is his thing. Like, I don't care. Ask for their spout. Ask for their permission to let their husband or wife make that decision without them. So it's just as simple as, okay, cool. Like this is not your thing right on. So th this is uh, Tammy's thing right here. So just to make sure, right? Like this stuff's expensive. Like you, you just told me you're not interested. So like, I'm going to show her like some things that are really expensive. Uh, you're okay with her making an expensive decision for the family without you. No, you'd probably want to talk about it. Okay, cool. Well, then I think it'd be best, Bill, if you at least just give me another minute or two to explain why we're worth it. That way you two can talk about it um, and just help her make the decision on what's best for your family. Because here's the thing. If he's not willing to listen, but he's not willing to let her make the decision, unless she's like a very empowered person, and this is vice versa, it's not just women, this is the same thing with men, right? Unless they're a very empowered person to make those decisions, they're probably at the end gonna say, okay, well, I gotta go talk to them now. So just get that out right away in the beginning. Don't be timid, save yourself some time because it's either gonna lead to you actually having a chance to close that order, or it's just gonna lead to you getting them out of the booth and talking to somebody who's actually ready to make a decision that day is actually at least willing to listen. So just have the discipline to make sure in each interaction you have at the booth, what you say and the actions you take have the chance to be their most influential. Because that's what we do. We can't control sales, but we influence them heavily. So we just want to try to be as influential as possible. And you guys, lastly, I do have a couple minor skill set things um, that I've learned and implemented that I think could provide value for maybe if you're not doing these things already. One thing that I've been taught through, you know, some of the coaching I've received is 
make sure you're inserting the word today early and often, especially when you're qualifying. So yeah, what we're doing here today at the show is the Cutco special today is this. Yeah, are you maybe in the market for some knives? You are great. Like if you saw something that you love, would you consider actually maybe like investing into your kitchen today? Right here, the special here today is this, right? Bring them into the present because so many people at the events that we work, so many other vendors are setting up business for the future. So using the word today brings them into the present to get them thinking like, oh, would I pull out my credit card today? Because how many times have we heard people walking up, hey, can I have a card? I'm just here getting ideas. And you're like, no, 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 this, this is not the idea booth. This is the you're buying stuff booth, right? So you guys, you can really pepper it in whenever. There's no like perfect time or wrong time. Just make sure you're using the word today right now um, here at the show. Here at the show is a really good one. Um, this is what we get to do here at the show today. Right. Just again, bring them through the present, make them where their feet are. You know, why people buy here at this event. Why people buy here at this event. You know, why we've done this event for two, three, six, 10 years, whatever the number is, right? Like reference those things. And then something that I really like to do is if I'm at a market specific event, so it's a very specific industry or market, like a hunting show, a boat show or an RV show, or maybe if the event is less of a buying atmosphere, maybe it's like a small town, like, I don't know if you guys have these, we have like food festivals, right? Where it's like the strawberry festival. Um, I work a bratwurst festival. Um, we have a sauerkraut festival, right? Where it's like, a lot of the food is focused on that one kind of food, but there's a lot of vendors. There's not many high quality of vendors. We're normally one of the most high quality things there besides maybe like some handmade furniture that's being sold at the event, right? So those events tend to have less of a buying atmosphere. People expect to show up there with their family and like spend some money on some food and see like the people in the community that they know. So I like to use this phrasing of, when I'm going over the five pay option, this is what I like to say. And oh, by the way, Cutco knows you didn't come to the Bratwurst Festival today to spend $5,000. But the reason we've done so well here and have been doing the event for five years now is because that they let you split it up over this easy pay option to try it out. So what you're doing there is instead of just telling them that they have the option to split it up, you've built value into why they should and why they can do it today. So you just, you, you put, you put a pin in the objection that they're going to give you. They're going to say, well, yeah, you know, we didn't come to this festival to spend to buy kitchen knives. Yeah, we know you didn't, but the reason why we do so well here and we've come back every year for the last six, seven, 10 years is because so many people get to have their cake and eat it too. They don't spend $5,000, but they still get the amazing cookware set that they've been wanting to get to replace for years and they get to have it for the rest of their life. And all you spend today is blank amount of dollars. This is the next tip I have for you guys, this skill set stuff. Um, when showing a past customer, what comes in the knife upgrade? Assume that they know about the four inch paring knife, the mini chopper, the cheese knife, and the hearty slicer. Because so many people have those now. So assume they know about them. So when you go to show them the cheese knife, you, you pull it out and you say, yeah, you have this one, right? If they say no, oh my God, this is like the most popular knife we make. You guys know how to sell a cheese knife, right? If they say yes, you say, oh, it's great, right? Yeah, but people who had this asked us to make this. And then you show them a Santoku cheese knife or whatever you like to show instead of a cheese knife, right? You go into your audible at that point. 
Now, what this does is this keeps you in control and doesn't create a negative tension. Because what you don't want to happen is you show a mini chopper and you're like, this one's so amazing. Everybody loves it. We came out with this cool new knife and they're like, oh, have it. And you're like, oh, well, we have this one. People really like it. They're like, okay, that's kind of cool. Then you show them the cheese knife and they're like, have it. What happens is they start to kind of maybe not lose trust, but they start to feel like, oh, my set is upgraded. I do have the cool things. So they start to be less excited about everything else you're showing them. So with those popular pieces, the idea is, yeah, you have this, like just assume they know about it. They have it, they use it. And then when they say they don't, it's very easy to like, oh, really? Oh, everybody has this. Then there's the feeling of, oh, wait, everybody has it. I'm a Cutco fan. I should have it too. All right, guys, I just got two more for you. I think I'm a little bit over on time, so I apologize. Uh, you guys, we would agree that it's important to have a package focus. Uh, within your package focus, I also want you to think about having a price point focus and how you can use a price point to be creative with packages. So let me give you a couple of examples. Say you showed somebody an ultimate upgrade. You drop down to a builder upgrade and they're just not into it. They don't really want to block. They like a lot of the knives. What you can do is show them the price of an 11 piece or like a 13 piece, you know, the showstopper set with six table knives. Ask them if that price works. Hey, if this was perfect and this was like the set for you um, and like, this was really designed for you. Would this price be okay in the budget for the next couple of months? Yeah, but like, I don't really want six table knives. No, I get, you know, I, I know that you said you didn't want them when you, when I showed you the upgrade, but what's cool is um, instead of getting you the six table knives, you'll get the five knives that you told me you like. Um, but there's also those other two you said you like too. Um, I'll just get you those two, right? So you'll get seven knives for the price of this 11 piece. The reason why you can do that is because you already know what five knives they really love because they picked out five for the builder upgrade. And then you can figure out two other things that they might like. Two smaller knives adds up to the price of around six table knives, right? So again, that's just being creative with a price point. Instead of me selling that customer just a five-piece bundle, I sold them a seven-piece bundle but I was able to build value in it being special by showing them the 11 piece sheet. You know, another example I have for you is someone maybe wants an ultimate upgrade, but they already have a sharpener and a medium cutting board because they have a galley plus six. So what can I do there? I can take out the medium cutting board and the sharpener and put in two more table knives. Because in an ultimate upgrade, it comes with four. I take those two things out, I put in two table knives, now it comes with 12. Now their set's basically complete. This may not be an objection. They explicitly tell you as to why they may not want the upgrade initially, but it can give them a better feeling about it actually completing their set. I had a customer, you know, who I was doing a home show in the Toledo area of Ohio one time who said she didn't want an upgrade. She's like, no, I think my set's fine. Um, you know, I really just need more table knives. I lost four of them. She had a homemaker plus eight, lost four. And I said, oh yeah, we can definitely just get you four more. But like, real quick, let me just check something for you. Um, what if I took out the cutting board set that comes in the upgrade and put in four more table knives? Now you'll have all the cool new knives, which I know you liked a lot of them, plus the block and you'll have 12 table knives on the bottom. And that's what sold her on the ultimate upgrade was getting that swap for free. So focusing on like price points and figuring out what the real objection is. Cause I think a lot of reps would have just maybe dropped down to selling that customer for table knives. And then you guys, a great question to ask when you're dropping down throughout packages, just to save time and to save customers from what I call the fatigue of saying no. 
if this right here was perfect, had everything in it that you wanted, nothing that you didn't, would this maybe work in the budget for the next few months? If they say it works in the budget, it's all you have to do is figure out the things that can go in that package to get them to buy it. You should close that order. If they say no, again, instead of going through like what comes in the next package, just simply ask the question of, okay, cool, that doesn't work. Would something maybe like $75 less per month work or would it have to be like 150? And those numbers can change. Sometimes I'll say $50 less per month versus 100. Uh, it depends on the vibe of the customer and kind of what package we're at already. But what they're telling you is if they say, oh, I, I could do like $75 less per month. What you ask them is would $75 less per month work or would it have to be like 150 less per month? And again, those numbers can change. They can fluctuate based on the customer you're talking to. But what they're doing there is telling you what they are comfortable budgeting per month. And then what I would do is I would tie them down if they tell me a number. So if they say, oh, it'd have to be like 150. Okay, cool. So what you're saying is like, if we found something that you really liked and it was like $150 less per month, you'd maybe end up getting it today if it was like perfect for you. Yeah, like, yeah, well, what would that be? Is like, if they're interested, they're going to ask, yeah, what would be in that? And then you just show them something that would fit there. So again, guys, that's just a question to ask to save yourself time. This is mainly for people where price is the main objection, right? So it saves time and it just tells you what they're comfortable spending. And you can always upserve from there. Like that doesn't mean you're like, like still do your job, upserve after that because getting the first yes, getting the credit card is the hardest part. And you guys, this is a real simple one. Um, just make sure you're taking note of the things people say in the beginning of your approach and use them as reasons to drop down. So, you know, old school, simple one you learned on, you know, first day of training. Do you host the holidays? No. Okay, cool. Back of my head, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to try to close them on a big set. Maybe I try to close them on an ultimate signature. No. Try to close them on a homemaker. No. Cool. Well, you know what? This Galley Plus Six, it's probably better for you because I know you said you don't host the holidays, so you don't need that holiday carving set. So I use the reason that they told, they use, I use some of the things that they told me as the reason as to why this next set works best for them. You guys, that's a real simple one. Um, so just to finish off, you know, I just want to share with you guys that I hope what you got from my message is most importantly, be intentional with the thoughts you have before and during the event. Be intentional with what you expect of yourself and what standard of discipline you hold yourself to. Um, and also, you know, a couple of those tips at the end, I hope, you sell, I hope they help you sell some more Cutco as well too, guys. But appreciate you having me on. Awesome. Appreciate it, Jess. That was complete fire. Uh, there was a lot of good nuggets in there. Um, I know a couple nuggets that I got. Um, I know I posted one in the chat. It was the, um, the uh, uh, people that track their average order get average results. So like, you know, don't worry about your average order. That's definitely a big thing. Um, uh, don't count CPO till the end of the day. I also find the days that I don't count CPO um i usually sell way more because then it's like i'm not attached to what i'm currently at you know i just keep the pedal to the floor and then um yeah just you know staying disciplined you know all the stuff that you brought there too is great so um jess if you if you don't mind sticking on for a couple questions if you got time we would yeah. definitely appreciate it i know we probably got some questions out there um does anyone have any questions for jess jess it's lucky hey man great message by the way Appreciate you having having you. Um, I wanted to like relay on that last um last um nugget you said. I think you were talking about um I forgot it, but like just like when it comes to like budgeting, like being like intentional with your budgeting. Can you like re repeat that verbiage? Yeah, yeah. So this is a situation where you you maybe dropped down a couple times already, right? You've already shown them a few packages. And what you're trying to avoid is customers start to feel the fatigue 
of saying no to you. Like they've said no three, four times. They start to feel negative and they're like, I guess Cutco is just not me for me today, right? Like I, maybe I just can't do it. Um, and what they'll sometimes do is they'll either be like, yeah, like we're good, you know, because um, they just don't want to keep going through the process with you because now you've at this point, you've probably had them for 20 minutes. Or what they'll do is maybe they really do want to get Cutco, uh, but they don't want to keep going through the process. They're like, well, here, like I'm just going to get these two, right? They want to make you happy. And it's a really nice thing the customer wants to do but like they could be a five piece, right? So they'll just say, well, let me just get these two, right? So what I do there is if I've start, gotten a few no's in a row is I'll just ask them before I even show somebody what comes in a set or it comes in a package or how it works is I'll just say, hey, like if this is perfect, would this number work in the budget for the next couple of months? And like I said, if it's yes, you should close them on that, whether you have to customize it, swap things out, like whatever. Um, if it's no, again, to save time and instead of showing them another option that you have to walk them through and see if it works, I ask the budget question, which is, okay, cool. Like that sounds like that's a little bit too much. No worries. What's cool with Cutco is we have a lot of different options, especially here at the booth today. We have so many more options here than what you'd see in a catalog or online. Just curious, would like $75 less per month work for you? Or would it have to be around like $125 less per month? And whatever number they tell you, they're telling you the number that they're comfortable affording. And so then it's just your job to remember what package you have the option offer or be creative Right, you know, and just dropping down to that number that they told you. So an example is if it's like a builder upgrade, which is around 1200 bucks, that's what, $300 per month. Um, if I say 125 less and now they're at like 175, I know that's around like an 11 piece. So I'll just show them the 11 piece and say, hey, like, would this work? This number work? Don't worry about what's in it. Would this number work? Or I'm going to say that number, then they're going to, yeah, sorry, let me backtrack. 125 less, it's at 175. Cool, I know that's an 11 piece. Cool, so what you're saying is 175 per month would work if it was like perfect for you. Awesome, I have a package I can show you. I show them the 11 piece, but then I tell them how they can take out the table knives for two different knives. I tell them how they can take out the table knives for three or four gadgets, right? Like it just becomes this really unique custom experience for the customer but it's based around a prepackaged price point because that makes it special for them. It's a special, but they can't do it anywhere else, right? Like it's a package that Cutco sells only through me. So it gives them motivation to want to do it today. I hope that clarifies. Lucky, I know that's kind of a lot. I got it. I'll see you in Aruba. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Uh, Josh, Josh Gord, go for it. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Love it. Um, I, I was curious on how you handle the husband objection, because that, that was kind of a sticking point for me this weekend. So I know it's not necessarily completely on anything that you covered. Because uh -huh. one, it's like, I feel like when I'm initially pitching them, they might say, oh, it doesn't matter. But then when I get to closing, it does matter. So I don't know if one, I can be qualifying that better. And then two, just being able to ask the right questions when I'm closing um, to actually close that. Okay. So just to clarify, right. It's like um, they, they, you asked in the beginning, Hey, you know, did you probably ask the question like, Hey, like who does most of the cooking at home? Yep. He says, Oh, I do. And then you're probably like, okay, cool. So like you could make, you'd feel comfortable making this decision today without your husband. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. That's how they respond. Right. Yep. And then it comes down to closing and they say, Oh, you know what? I got to talk to my husband. Um, right. That's kind of what happened, Josh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, this is tough. It's something I still am trying to working on too, but I think just being bold in the beginning and just saying flat out, like, hey, just so you know, like, this stuff is expensive. Um, 
So like, we're not talking, you know, a hundred dollars, like, you know, that we average around $150 a knife. Uh, like when it comes to buying things for the home, Cutco knows that people like to do this as a family, but not the family's not always together, right? And we have really unique specials for here at the show. And what's great is that's where, Josh, I would reference the 15-day guarantee, right? And you, you know, you know that verbiage, right? Where it's like, we have this here. So that way, like husbands can make decisions about their wives, wives can make decisions about their husbands, right? Um, and then we have a really even, and this I would bring up the easy pay at this point. And we have a really cool easy pay where you don't have to pay for the whole thing at once. Um, so just curious, like if you saw something that you loved and you really believed would be great for your family's future, something that you'd have for the next 30, 40, 50 years, and really would make your life easier in the kitchen, how mad do you think your husband would be if you spent three, 400 bucks today, 500 bucks today? Would he be okay with that if you, if it was something that you were buying for the family? And just like, you know, I think just being bold you know, building a lot of value in that statement, right? The forever, the 40, 50 years, make them feel good with the 15 day guarantee. Hey, we know this is something you want to do with your family, but you know, you're, he's just not here, right? But the special's here. You know what I mean? Um, this being bold and being willing to like ask, could you do it today? And if not, it sucks when it's like the woman who walked up, like I want knives. She looks like the money customer, right? Nice person, but like, I just truly think it'd probably be better to get her information, try to set up a follow-up time and move on to the next customer. Or, you know, if they're sick, you know what? You, yeah, try to close her, right? If it's slow, I think try to close her either way. But if it's like a good busy event, it, it's like, it hurts your soul, right? They look perfect, um, but they're not perfect, right? Again, don't make assumptions of these people. Um, there's somebody better walking around. It's kind of just like the attitude I have, abundance mindset, right? So be bold, ask the questions in the beginning because if you don't ask them now, you're going to get answers that you don't want later. Awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. Awesome, any other questions for Jess? Anything at all? Any questions? Going once. We got one more question for Jess. Anything? Okay, cool. Well, hey, Jess, appreciate you being on here. Um, definitely one of the better talks that we've had here for our team. So appreciate you delivering. Um, great talk. And uh, won't see you in Aruba, but look forward to seeing you at the next uh, net or coordinator summit or you know whatever else what other what other we have going on whatever else is coming up i uh, look forward to seeing you then man cool well appreciate you guys uh thanks for having me on and good luck the rest of the year appreciate it man yep okay guys so hopefully you guys got some nuggets there um that was a fire talk um so yeah so big thing is just make sure you know just uh you know obviously you know if you didn't get everything written down, I would definitely go back and watch this talk. Even if you did, um, there's definitely some good uh, mentality and discipline tips um, that's just going to help you sell more. I remember uh, this past weekend, uh, Josh and I were talking, you know, how, how to sell bigger packages. And I honestly think the biggest thing is just believing that you can sell that big package. You know, be okay talking it with those big numbers, right? Be okay selling a $6,000 package. But it's like you have to have the right mentality in order to, you know, deliver to that person and not be like, oh, my gosh, this is like a two thousand dollar order. This is huge. Right. There's people I can sell, you know, and then, uh, you know, we had a realization that there was some guy selling trailers for like 10 to 20 grand. And he's like, yeah, I'm looking for like 15 to 30 orders this weekend. It's like and his low number is 10 grand. Right. And there's people spending that, which is nuts. Right. So people spend money. Um, well, yeah, um, next we got the drawing here. So for those of you that stuck on here, um, I don't know if we, did we lose another person here? Uh-oh, someone might get cut. I'm just going to double check here.
Okay, cool. Well, yeah. So, um, yeah, I got the little uh, spinner here. I'll share that with you guys. Um, so for those of you that liked the post before the call started, I got you added to this. And then also um, everyone that was on the call or still is currently on the call, you are also on here. So um, we're uh, so this hat right here, if you guys didn't know, if you didn't see the group me post and you're just here on the call. Um, so I just got these. Um, they're camouflage Petco hats. They're pretty sweet. Um, but uh, I've got five to give away. So um, I'll ship it to you guys, whoever wins. But um, we're going to go ahead and spin. You guys ready? Free stuff? Sports show hat? Here we Let's go. Let's go. Just spit the hat. Hat, hat, hat. There we go. Adam Mundy, first winner. Congrats, Adam. I told you it was my hat. There you go. Yup. Won't be this one. I'll get you, I'll get you a brand new one. There we go. Well, yes. um, we'll remove Adam. I need a bigger, faster spin. Nick Johnson. Spin it harder. <laughs> awesome. You ready? Kev, you think this is yours? Put me on the other side to start. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. lucky. Congrats, man. Oh. Wow, we're on like a little lag here. Oh, did I did I announce it before the spin? Yeah, before it landed. Number four. Oh, oh. Sierra. And then we got one more. One more hat. And then we'll have to do a that a boy at the end, too. Oh, Kevin. Kevin. Did I win? Let's go! Oh, that's so rigged. Give me that. It was literally, it was literally by like a hair too. Like, I thought it was. <laughs> look at how close good. that is. <laughs> oh my god! Sorry, JD. And then <laughs> this person doesn't win, but we'll spin because we always do this. It'd be funny if it's JD. Oh, Josh Gord, so close. It's all right. I still want to start that attaboy, baby. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Awesome. Well, congrats to the five winners. Uh, if you could text me, if you're on the call, text me your address, and I will get that shipped to you. Uh, Kevin, I'll just give it to you since we live like 10 minutes apart. But um, the other four of you, just text me your address. We'll get it shipped out to you. And then um, we're going to end early today. My voice is killing me. So, um, so yeah. You got the next half hour to hang out here, do whatever. But yeah, if you have any other questions, feel free to stick on. Otherwise, appreciate you guys jumping on. We'll see you next month. Do do we know who's speaking next month? Do we get a Nick. we get a preview or uh... uh lucky if you want to give it do we have a preview for May? Isn't that I think I know who that is. Find out in May. No, I'm kidding. Find out in May. Should I'm I do that to them, Nick? Or you can you can share Lucky. Yeah, I'll share. Um, next month for May, we have L.A. Gonzalez speaking and Calvin Lopez speaking. So it's going to be two two speakers on the call. It's a twofer. Nice. You're welcome on this guy, this speaker, by the way. So. Yep. Great job, Lucky. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Uh, anybody who's going to Aruba, and I'll talk to everyone else later. Yep. We'll see you, man. Rob, anything?